Scrubs, what the hell do they even do? <laughs> I've seen some memes going around and it seems like no one actually understands what the hell graphs are doing in 3D animation. What the hell are you talking about? So today that's what I'm going to show you what is happening in the graph and how that relates to what's happening in your scene when you're animating. I'm going to be using Autodesk Maya for all of these examples, but all of these concepts apply to all 3D packages. So stick around Blender guys, please. I need your views. Thank you. The graph editor is one of the most misunderstood tools in 3D animation. It took me a very long time, even working professionally for a few years before I really understood what it was showing me and how I could use it to clean up my work. So we're going to dive into that today. Hopefully you're going to learn a lot. So let's go. So to understand the relationship between our manipulators in space here and our graph editor, we're going to have to understand a few key concepts. Let's start by focusing on translations. If I rotate this cube away from its default position and I go back to our transform controller, what you'll see is that our axes are now pointing to follow the orientation that we just rotated to. So we're pointing this way, this is the way it's facing. However, if I move one of these axes, what you'll see is that all of the channels are moving here. So I'm moving just the Y axis, but it's moving all three of our translation channels. And if we grab just the Y in the graph editor and move it around, you'll see that it's not moving along that axis at all. It's moving straight up and down in this case. So what's happening is we're currently viewing our translation manipulator in object mode. If I hold down W and click in Maya, we're gonna pull up this marking menu and you'll see that we're in object mode right now. The object manipulator is just an intuitive way to pose, but it isn't super related to what's happening in the graph. So you can't really trust it. So the key thing to understand when it comes to translation is that a control's parent's orientation determines what its child's translations are doing in the graph editor. So if we rotate the parent control over to the side and then add some rotation to the child control, even though our object gimbal has moved with it, the thing you need to actually look at is if you hold down W, go to axes, is the parent manipulator. So now if we move one of these, it's only going to move one of these axes, which also means if we go to say translation Z in the graph, if we move this, it's just going to move along that one axis. An easy way to check this is by switching back to object mode on a control's parent. If we compare the object manipulator on a parent control to its child's parent manipulator, they line up exactly. It should also be noted that if a control is at the very top of a hierarchy, its parent manipulator is going to be perfectly aligned to the world, the default grid here. And as such, that's what's going to show up in the graph for it there. So let's say we want to make a character walk along a path. A common beginner issue I see is that they rotate a child's axes and then animate along that object path. As we've just found out, this is now going to be moving two different axes to walk along that path, right? So if we look at the parent axes, we'll see what's actually happening is we have to move an equal distance between these two axes to be able to move in this diagonal direction. Instead, you should rotate the parent one way and now the parent axes of the child controller means that we'll be able to move in one axis and be able to track that really easily in the graph. So for another example, let's say we're having a character acting to camera. Sometimes what I like to do is I'll take the camera's rotation Y, so it's orientation, and I'll paste it onto the root node for the rig. I'll then have to go back in and pose my character. But once this is done, if I set my axis back to parent, what you'll see is that the camera and the character are now perfectly aligned to each other. So when I'm animating a character standing there and acting to camera, it's really easy to then look at the axes and animate in camera space for all of our biggest controllers, like our center of gravity, our IK feet, and so on. So now that we have a good understanding about the relationship between our translation manipulators and our graph editor, let's talk about rotations. If I change the rotation of this object and then rotate along one axis, we're once again going to see that we are moving all of our axes here. And if we grab one of these rotation axes in the graph and move it around, you'll see it's not actually moving along this line at all. This is again because if you hold down E this time and left click, we are in object mode. Once again, the object manipulator is great for posing, but it does not show us what the graph is actually telling us. The same thing goes for world actually. You can pose with the world manipulator, but again, it's going to move all of these axes. When it comes to rotations, we need to be looking at the gimbal manipulator. When using the gimbal manipulator, if we move one of these axes, you'll see that it's only moving one channel. And if you move the graph, you'll see we're moving along these axes, which are displayed with the gimbal manipulator. Now, rotations aren't quite as simple as translations to understand. I'd recommend this amazing video by Gorilla CG on Euler rotations and gimbal lock. It's going to give you a really good understanding of what's going on. I'm going to attempt to summarize some of the points here, but definitely check this out for some extra context. So all rotations in 3D software are determined by a rotation order. This means that one of the rotations is going to lead the other rotations. One of the rotations is going to lead one of the rotations and one of them is going to be completely isolated. In this case, the Z is the parent of both the Y and the X. The Y is the parent of the X. And the X is the child control. If I go over to my attribute editor and I go over to the control settings here, what you can see is the rotation order. Rotation orders are actually backwards. So the Z here is the parent, the Y is the middle and the X is the child. You can run into issues whenever the middle letter in the hierarchy, so this time Y, is overused. If we overuse Y too much, we can line up these two controls here perfectly. And this is what's called gimbal lock. This means we have no way to describe the tilt of this cube right now because these two axes are on top of each other. We can switch back to our object manipulator and move along this axis. But what you'll see is that lots of weird rotations are going to be happening. We're not cleanly moving along that axis. 
This is happening because there's no clean axis to move along. Instead, all three of our axes have to fire at once to figure our way between this pose and this pose with our current rotation order. They are all trying to move between our first pose and our second pose at the same time, but getting tangled within each other and causing lots of mess and weird rotations. The general rule of thumb is that you want to make sure the rotation that you use the most is the highest in the rotation order and the axis that we use the least is the second in the rotation order. This way we run into the least amount of gimbal issues as possible and our graph is as simple and as clear as possible. So in this case we're going to use Y a lot so we want to make sure that Y is the final letter. So when we turn Y it's going to take the other two axes with it and in this case I made Z the next most prioritized and then X the most, next most. The truth is there is no perfect rotation order for every situation. Depending on what you need the control to do, depends on what rotation order you should be using to make sure that your graph is as clean as possible. If you've already got poses on your character and you go to change the rotation order, you're going to notice that it changes the pose completely. But there are ways around this. Let's say I've already created some poses here. I'm going to have a character look to the left, ease in, and then they're going to turn back this way. If I have the wrong rotation order, you can run into weird issues like this, with loads of spinning and breaking. If we switch back to gimbal, we can see why that's happening. It's because we're running into gimbal look issues where the controls are overlapping each other a lot. The great thing is there are tools out there which let you switch the rotation order even after you have begun animating. A tool I really like is Morgan Loomis's free convert rotation order. I'll link to this in the description. Once you open the tool from your shelf, you can analyze a frame that has a broken rotation order. Click the get tips for selection button and it will tell you how well gimbal the control is and what rotation order it suggests to switch to in order to fix the gimbal issues. Here I'm going to click on ZXY in order to fix these issues. So now we fixed the gimbal issues we were having without changing our keyed poses on these frames. This could be a super powerful tool to help your graph make a lot more sense with what's going on. Sometimes you can run into issues like this. Even though I'm moving between two poses where I'm just rotating the cube this way, we have a lot of spinning and weirdness going on. But this time it isn't because of the rotation order. We can see that we're not really gimbling here. So whenever this is happening, you can usually see that one of the curves in the graph is doing a big change. So even though the pose is only changing in screen space a little bit here, it's actually doing a full 360 degree change to get to that same pose. Sometimes Maya will just decide to flip a control 360 degrees and then when you press play, it will mess up completely. So an easy way to fix this is to select the curves, go to curves and then Euler filter in the graph here. And when you press that, it's going to figure out what the, what's happening with that rotation and fix it completely. So now that we understand what's showing up in our graph in terms of translations and rotations, there's one more thing we need to understand, which is spaces. In rigs, almost all controls are in hierarchies. You have a control which moves everything and then within that you have controls which move more and more isolated parts of the body. Usually when animating our main IK controllers, such as our center of gravity, our feet, sometimes our hands if we're using hands in IK, these are all world space controllers. What that means is that what we see in the graph is not being influenced by anything else. If I move this foot up, the channels that we see here are not being influenced by anything else. If I move the body like this, again, this is a world space controller, so everything we're seeing in the graph is exactly what's happening. But if we look at something like the chest now, in the graph, nothing is happening. None of the values have changed, even though the chest has moved over here in space. And this is because it's in a hierarchy, right? It's underneath the center of gravity. It's moving the upper body when you move the center of gravity. So when you're animating a child controller, what you're actually seeing in the graph is the offset from the parent controller. Whenever you reset your control, in the graph on a child controller, it is moving it back to line up perfectly with the parent controller. Oftentimes, rigs will give you the ability to change the space of a controller. So this chest controller right now is following the body, but we can switch it to follow global in both translation and rotation. But if we do that, it's going to move the controls away from where they were originally. Fortunately, there are tools in Animbot and in other places like here where we can switch to global space for all of our keys. And now this is actively representing what's happening in 3D space. So for the side to side movement, this is being tracked in 3D space now. And you can see if we move the cog, it's not actually moving the chest at all because the chest is in world space. It's often best to animate pretty far into your process with your controllers in local space, in a hierarchy. But then when you get into polishing up things up and getting into really tiny details, it's often a good workflow to switch things to world space so you can then clean up any little jitters or bumps without breaking the connectivity that we've got for free by having it in a hierarchy. Often rigs will give you the ability to make some of the controls follow the translation of a control but not the rotation. So even though we're tilting here, the arms and the head are keeping the orientation that they already had. If we twist this body, you'll see that the head is still pointing forward. This is a great balance as we can now animate and keep the connectivity of body parts but have a simple and easy to follow graph for the rotations of certain controls. So this is my preferred workflow for head controls and FK arms. Let's look at a practical example now and show how we can use the graph editor to clean up our animation. So here I have a head turn, but there's something a bit weird happening with the head popping around a bit and something strange is happening. Let's look at the head controller. 
And I'm going to go into my gimbal mode by holding E and going to gimbal. And I want to check on my rotation Y. One quick tip I want to give is if you right click on the channels and you sync selection in graph editor and sync selection in time display, whenever I click on one of these channels, it's only going to show up the channel in the graph that I've clicked on. And also the keys that we see in the timeline are only going to be the ones for the channel I've clicked on. That way I can clean things up without putting a load of extra keys on channels that I don't want them on. Let's look at this curve. So we have a lot of starting and stopping and changing of direction going on in here, which is causing this jitteriness and poppiness. Since we know that this curve is only moving this channel, we're moving along this axis and we have this kind of change. So this, in my opinion, is a bad curve because it doesn't follow any kind of rule of physics. It doesn't follow the rule of progressive spacing. Progressive spacing basically means that the spacing between each key is either getting bigger over time or smaller over time. By following that rule, we're basically following physics. Something has to start from one position, build up speed over time, and then slow down speed over time to get to its next position. That's the rule of progressive spacing. Since we want this head move to be one clean, smooth motion, I'm going to move this curve around in a way where it gets steeper through the middle more and more steep through the middle and then slows down more and more as time goes on. So I think we can just delete this and maybe raise this slightly, raise this. I don't really want it to come to a complete flat at the top because that means nothing is happening. It's completely stopped. I'm going to give it a little bit more ease at the very end just so that it has a little bit further to go and doesn't come to a complete stop. That's a common issue I see with beginner work where their movement will come to a complete stop instead of a moving hold, which is what we refer to when a movement is basically in a held pose, but has just a little bit of drift just to keep it alive and stop it from feeling too dead. So now that we've cleaned up that curve, we can see that this motion feels a lot cleaner. I want to emphasise that it is okay to add slight holds between your pose to pose moves. So here we're turning our head from left to right, but we have kind of a small hold in the middle. That's fine as long as we are following our rule of progressive spacing. So here we speed up, we get steeper into this move, then we start to shallow out how steep the curve is to ease into this slight hold, and then we speed up again into our another next pose. So even though this curve has a bump in it, it's still following our rule of progressive spacing because we are during our movement either getting bigger between each of our frames or smaller between each of our frames. Even though there's a hold in the middle, we are still following that kind of general rule of physics. So it's perfectly fine to do by adding little imperfections and hesitations in a character's movement can help to bring its life and feel a lot more organic. Don't just completely smooth out every curve. As long as there's intention behind why you're doing something, there's reasons why you might want to add small holds and hesitations like this. I would also check out this video by Alessandro, who talks about being very intentional with what you're cleaning in the graph. As just cleaning things when you're running into issues with gimbal, even if it's just a little bit of gimbal, can completely kill your arcs and flow in your animation. So you need to have real intentionality behind why you're making certain decisions and why you're cleaning graphs in a certain way. It's also very important to understand the difference between cleaning up controls which are world space controls and controls which are child controls. When cleaning up world space controls, you can usually smooth those curves out with progressive spacing, and that's going to be the correct thing to do. But remember, when you're cleaning up child controllers, you're actually just cleaning up the difference between its parent and itself. As such, you need to have real intentionality with how you're cleaning that stuff up so that you're not destroying all the work with spacing and arcs that you did when you were in blocking. Here, I want to talk about the relationship between curves and how that affects arcs in our motion. So here, we're just looking at our cube in a flat plane. We're moving along two axes, the Y, the up and down, and the Z, which is the side to side in this case. What you'll notice is they're both on the same keys here and as such, they're hitting in a diagonal fashion. If we want to add arcs to something, we need to add offset between the side to side of a thing and the up and down of a thing to create that arc. So here, if we grab our translation Y and we make it maybe hit two frames later, you'll see that we've added some slight arcs to this motion now. By making it later, the Y kicks in a little bit later and as such, we arc over the top this way. If we go back two frames to what we had before, we're just hitting diagonally. If we go a couple frames before that, we scoop around this way and so on and so on. So when looking for arcs in motion, you need to have a breakup in the side to side of a thing and the up and down of a thing. So they arrive, they leave and arrive at a pose at different times. The more offset a thing is, if I bring this curve even earlier, the more arky it is. The closer to what it was before, make it one frame instead of two frame difference. By bringing this over one, the arc's going to be slightly shallower. And then if we bring this over one more, we're moving in a diagonal line once again. So here we have a cube moving across screen. The spacing is progressive and the curve looks pretty clean to me. So I'll translate Y doesn't have any keys right now, but if we wanted to add an arc to this motion between these two poses, a trick I often use is finding the fastest point of movement in the side to side of a thing and making the apex of the up and down of the thing hit on that frame. I'm also just gonna make it ease in and ease out a little bit. And if we exaggerate this curve, so if I scale this up, I've got a hotkey for that. You can see that we've added an arc now quite simply. And you can play around with that arc by offsetting even more. Can choose where the dip of that arc kicks in. You could do the opposite. So you arc over the top by flipping the curve. This is a general rule of thumb I follow in tons of cases. Let's go back to a head turn here and talk about that relationship once again. 
So this head turn has no arc right now. So what we need to look at is the side to side of the head turn, in this case, rotation Y, and the up and down of the head turn, in this case, rotation X. So the rotation Y is just going across, which is fine. Let's look at the rotation X. Not much is going on here, which is such a minor difference here that not much is actually happening. So let's follow that rule we just learned. If we want to add an arc to this, let's go to the fastest point in the rotation Y, in the side to side. Let's add an apex to the up and down of it. And then we can kind of work our way by easing in and out of this across our frame range. And now we've added an arc to that head turn. We could exaggerate it by scaling it up. A bit too big. But just by paying attention to that relationship, you can add arcs to all sorts of body parts. So when cleaning up your curves, always pay attention to the side to side of the thing and the up and down of the thing and their relationship to each other in order to create your arcs. That's as far as we're going to go in this video. There is a ton of more things with Graph Editor, tips and tricks, different things that we can talk about. But I just wanted to talk about the main concepts of understanding what the graph is actually showing you in relation to your scene. That way you can kind of build your knowledge upon that. It's like a really strong basis to base upon and then you can kind of go from there. Let me know if everything's clear and if you have any questions. Um, make sure to subscribe and like and everything to support the channel. Maybe next time I'll make a video quicker than having a six month gap, hey? All right, see you next time.